I never knew I was such a hard act to follow. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank Warren Lustig and, uh, and Jeff for uh, taking the time to put that together. It obviously took a huge amount of effort. Um, this is quite an award. Uh, I remember when Ed Bradley won it a number of years ago and Don Hewitt came out to present it. And um, Don says it's a big, you know, said it was really a big deal. And uh, since then, I've always considered to be sort of a the best, and it is, as I told a reporter today, the capstone, really, of my career. Um, I would not uh, be up here tonight if it weren't for a lot of people, not a lot, but a, a certain number of people I want to acknowledge here tonight. Um, beginning with Fred Friendly, who was my first mentor at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism uh, and took a very early interest in, in my career. He was a, a huge presence and uh, he validated every reason that uh, all his students had when they decided that they wanted to get into journalism and he always instilled in us uh, the possibilities um, of what a career in journalism could be if, uh, if you did it properly. I want to acknowledge uh, Don Hewitt uh, who is one of the greatest editors of the 20th century uh, who gave me uh, a wonderful opportunity and sprayed his enthusiasm and sprinkled his genius on everybody uh, who was around him. And I want to thank Jeff, who I've uh, worked with uh, for most of the last 25 years, uh, and who performed the impossible feat of succeeding Don Hewitt. And, uh, and he's become, I think, the, the best uh, executive in television news. There was also Tom Batag and Howard Stringer and Mark Harrington and Joan Richmond and Phil Scheffler uh, and all my producers at, at 60 Minutes that I worked with over the years who have done most of the heavy lifting. And uh, last but not least, my esteemed colleagues, Mike Wallace, Morley Safer, Ed Bradley, Leslie Stahl, Harry Reasoner, Bob Simon, Scott Pelley, and Andy Rooney, who set the bar incredibly high. Uh, and have kept the standards there for 40 years. Uh, tonight is one of those occasions when you step back and you look at your life and, and ponder now what is, uh, for me, really a 40-year career in journalism. Uh, this time last year, uh, I was uh, roaming through the catacombs of, uh, of the CBS Broadcast Center in search of an old but distinguished piece of uh, furniture for my new office and uh, peering through all these dark storage rooms uh, with Jeff's assistant looking for uh, uh, a table and a filing cabinet. And I came upon this old metal locker and the, the door was open and uh, inside on the door was was attached a sheet of paper uh, with old yellow scotch tape and it was sort of brown and it looked like it had been there for really a long time. And it said, uh, the television business is a cruel, shallow money trench. <laughs> A long plastic hallway where thieves and pimps run free and good men and women die like dogs. Then there's the negative side. <laughs> I don't know who wrote it or put it on the locker, but uh, given its age and the state of our industry, I'm pretty sure they're no longer employed in broadcasting. <laughs> We're all getting a, a taste of uh, the negative side of the business right now. Uh, for decades, uh, television and radio had, uh, in exchange for a pledge to serve the public interest, a, a license to print money, a franchise that now seems to belong exclusively to Wall Street. Uh, and we're all struggling to get by. There have been, as you all know, huge cutbacks uh, not just at the networks, but at local newsrooms around the country. Uh, and a few operations have already shuttered their, uh, their operations. And, 
and others have begun to ask the once unthinkable question, can we afford to stay in the news business? It's part of the crisis that journalism faces today. Uh, there are economic forces working against us. Technological changes and shrinking profit margins uh, have put our profession in peril. Television journalism, as you all know, began getting squeezed a couple of decades ago when cable began to, uh, to penetrate and uh, thin out our audiences and, and our revenues. Now the newspapers are going through it only in a much faster pace. Uh, and that's all a result, most of it, a result of the internet. The business model of chopping down trees and hauling them off on railroad uh, cars to pulp plants uh, and, and printing up the news using union crews um, and paying somebody else to deliver the product to the, the uh, your doorstep every morning is a, a dying business model. It, it may be around for a while, but ultimately it's not going to survive. Uh, it's why the Rocky Mountain News went out of business, why there are 13 major newspapers in bankruptcy right now, why former great newspapers like uh, the Miami Herald and the Los Angeles Times and the, and the Baltimore Sun are, are shells in themselves, and why the New York Times even uh, is wondering about its own long-term survival. The endangered product is not so much news as the general people, uh, general population would uh, uh, look at it. Um, it is reporting, original reporting, going out and actually finding what's going on, knocking on doors, making phone calls, checking facts, finding divergent opinions, analyzing the information and putting it down uh, either in some sort of a, a, a television form or written form for the internet and for the newspaper. It takes a lot of time, it takes talented reporters, it takes editors, uh, it takes commitment. And those are all very difficult things for bookkeepers and accountants to place a value on. But the economic structure that uh, supported it for so long uh, is crumbling now and the future is in flux. It's fashionable to say that I get all of my news from the internet and I'm sure you run into people like that all the time who say I don't read newspapers, I don't watch television, I get my news from the internet. But chances are uh, the product that they're getting online whether it's from Google or from the Huffington Post or the Daily Beast, uh, has been gathered, chances are likely, by the New York Times, by the Associated Press, by Reuters, by the Washington Post, and been given away for free or virtually free uh, to the websites, though I suspect that model is about to change. Uh, and, and I don't know, and nobody knows, what happens to that free or virtually free contact or content or the content even if they have to end up paying for it if the people who are actually going out and performing the function can no longer afford to do it. Uh, newspapers are discovering uh, that the revenues that they generate from online coverage, uh, from out online advertising, don't even begin to cover the costs of going out and covering the news, of sending journalists to the courthouse or the police station and to find out what's going on, let alone for the New York Times or the Chicago Tribune to run in staff bureaus in places like Moscow and Beijing, where it's paramount for people in the United States to actually know what's going on. Columnist William Falk wrote last year that he wondered whether free websites would ever be able to attract enough eyeballs to generate and pay for the kind of intensive four-month investigation that the Washington Post did on the conditions at Veterans Hospital uh, around the country and specifically at uh, Walter Reed Hospital. Uh, and, and Falk raised the question, does it really matter 
And then he answered his own question by saying, you need to ask that question to the veterans at Walter Reed. There have been few times in our history where information has been more important or mattered more. Uh, it's power. It's money. In the words of uh, the legendary editor uh, Gene Roberts from the New York Times and later the Philadelphia Inquirer, it's what feeds democracy. And he said last week at the Polk Awards that when newspapers and electronic media cut back their staffs, more things go unreported and thus unwritten or unsaid. And what democracy and what a democratic society does not know, it cannot act on. And nowhere is it more important but often overlooked than in local communities. I, I don't think that some of you realize how important you are to the functioning of local communities. You're where people turn to in times of crisis, in times of natural disaster. They look for information and they look for help. And I think that you have to keep that in mind in the months and, and years uh, ahead. It's very difficult to look ahead even six months in this business, let alone four or five years or ten years. Uh, it's virtually impossible. You don't know who's going to be delivering the news. You don't know what form it's going to take. You don't know what kind of a device or gadget or appliance people are going to be uh, uh, receiving it on. But um, I'm fairly optimistic, and I'm optimistic for this reason. I think what we do is so important that somebody will figure out a, a business model. I can't foresee the day in which this country and this society would leave providing information to the chaos of the internet. And I say there are certain, and I don't mean to be down on the internet because I think it's, it's done some wonderful things for journalism. It's kept us on our toes. It's provided speed. It's provided immediacy. But there are problems with it. Um, you need to know where the information is coming from. You need to know that it's been vetted and checked by people. And that has been the contribution through the years of our profession, and I think it's the thing that will keep us alive. Somebody in this society has to perform that function. And I think it's a function that people will, in the end, pay for, um, as long as they're not getting it for free. Uh, and I think that local television news is actually very well positioned for it. Uh, better positioned than most people uh, in the media landscape. Uh, it's going to require innovation. It's going to require uh, inquire, uh, maybe some partnerships with very people, various peoples in the community. I think it's going to require um, a strong presence on the internet. I think it's going to require uh, maybe some backpack journalism to get through this uh, chaotic period of transition that we're going through. Uh, but I would say to you, don't be bullied by your sales department and don't be bullied by accountants who tell you that you can't afford to do news, who are constantly looking at the bottom line. It's going to be, I think, the most valuable asset of local stations going forward. Because without it, you're just one more cable channel in a thousand channel universe. Uh, it's what's going to keep you relevant and what's going to keep you in the business is serving that community as in the public interest, as your license says. It's one of the few businesses where I ever hear that word anymore. Not very many people pay attention to it. So I urge you, don't get too discouraged and fight on. Thank you for this award.
Congratulations very much, Steve, on an honor well deserved. That is our formal presentation, but the event is not over yet. We would like you to join us for a reception, proudly supported by our friends at CBS News in 60 Minutes. The doors behind you open, drinks and hors d'oeuvres and other fine stuff. And a chance to meet Steve Croft. So thank you very much, and again, congratulations to Steve Croft. Thank you.